I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today, and I'd certainly like to thank Small Business Administrator Maria Contreras-Sweet for being here today to highlight the impact of small businesses and the Export-Import Bank and many other issues she fights for for small business. I also want to welcome Bobby Patton from Patton Electronics Company in Maryland, and he's going to tell his own individual story, and he will be introduced by Senator Cardin. And I'm so glad to be joined by both my colleagues, Senator Cardin and Senator Kane. Senator Cardin is a member of the Small Business Committee, and Senator Kane has been the co-chair of a manufacturing caucus where lots of small businesses who are impacted by having uh, financing and credit financing. Uh, I also want to thank Senator Johnson for his work on the Banking Committee, but he couldn't be with us this morning. And we are here today to talk about the many small businesses across America that are about mainstream jobs. We have 16 legislative days left, according to the Senate published calendar, to get the Export-Import Bank reauthorized. Now is the time for Congress to act. Those who oppose the bank have shown that they would stop the bank altogether if they were given the chance, and the failure to act is hurting companies like Bobby's who need this kind of security to make sure their products reach customers outside the United States. 95% of consumers are outside the United States of America, and with a global middle class that is going to double over the next 16 years, we need every advantage to try to reach those customers. This is a very competitive global economy with a huge market opportunity for American businesses. But we want Americans to have a level playing field and to be able to compete for those economic opportunities. As a chairwoman of the Small Business Committee, I want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to help small businesses become exporters. Uh, Administrator Contreras Sweet and myself and Senator Risch have been working on a program the funding and authorization of the STEP program, which has been a pilot program to help small businesses become exporters. 3,413 small businesses used the Export-Import Bank services last year, companies like Patent Electronics, and nine out of every 10 transactions completed by the XM Bank were small business, and the bank added 625 new businesses last year, a record high. So we want to send a clear message about voting against the Export-Import Bank. You are hurting these small businesses. I've heard from small businesses all over the state of Washington who have used the Export-Import Bank, a music stand maker in Yakima, Washington, to a grain silo manufacturer in Spokane, to a machine shop company in Vancouver, Washington. Some of the bank's critics point out that it would only benefit large organization companies like Boeing or GE but behind every one of a Boeing or GE company are thousands of supply chain companies that make parts for these manufacturers. In fact, there are 33,000 small and mid-sized companies who benefit from the XM Bank, according to a 2011 study on the Coalition for Employment for Exports. So I think that you see on this chart here where those companies are throughout the United States of America. So. We need to continue to have this kind of support because it has supported over 1.2 million jobs over the last five years. So it's time for Congress to act. We urge our colleagues to make sure that this becomes a priority for us to get done. And with that, I'd like to introduce the Small Business Administrator, Maria Contreras-Sweet. Thank you, Senator uh, Cantwell, for your incredible championship of small business. The president asked me to do three things when he nominated me. He asked me to run the SBA, to provide a voice for small businesses across the country, and to take small businesses to the next level. And that's what this speaks to, is how we take small businesses to the next level. I want to add my voice in full support of the reauthorization of the XM Bank. This is an institution that thousands of small businesses depend on, and failure to reauthorize XM would be delib delib <laughs> excuse me, debilitating to these entrepreneurs. 95%, as the chairwoman said, of the world's consumers live outside of our borders, and only 1% of American businesses are partaking of that opportunity. Export markets are the next great frontier for U.S economic growth. Over the next decade, one billion consumers in the emerging world 
are going to join the middle class. Our small businesses must sell to them in order to remain competitive. I've talked to many entrepreneurs across the country. They are eager to participate in the international marketplace, but they have uncertainty about getting paid by foreign buyers halfway around the globe. Exim removes that uncertainty by offering insurance products that guarantee that they'll get paid. If small businesses are the engine that powers our economy, then Exim is the fuel that keeps our engine from stalling in the global trade routes of the 21st century. Exports have been a true bright spot in our economic recovery, supporting nearly 10 million American jobs, according to the Department of Commerce. Exim has financed more small business exports in the last five years than the previous 11 years combined. Last year, again, nine out of 10 transactions that Exim financed were with small businesses. If we fail to reauthorize Exim, it'll be a unilateral disarmament because 60 other leading economies around the world have similar agencies that are helping open global markets for their entrepreneurs. We've got to make certain that we understand that small business and large businesses are American business. I'm a former banker. When you find a bank with a 0.21% default rate, you don't eliminate it, you support it. That's why outside of the Beltway, where Exim's impact on small businesses is truly felt, this is not a controversial issue. It's a bipartisan issue. 36 of American governors, Republicans and Democrats, have sent letters urging Congress to act to reauthorize this wonderful institution. Exim is an institution that is all upside. It's financing that doesn't cost American taxpayers a dime. And as a banker, I like return on investment. In fact, the bank sends a check to the US Treasury every year. They earn profits on top of covering all of their own costs to run this bank. So what's the issue? This allows them to return billions of dollars to the American taxpayer. On behalf of American small businesses, and as someone who believes exporting is critical to our economic well-being, I urge members of Congress to support this five-year authorization so that Exim can continue to do its work and help small businesses continue to create two out of three net new jobs and employ half of America's private workforce. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no issue here. This is a win, win, win. Small businesses will win, America wins, and all of us will continue to expand the middle class. Just to add another voice, I'd like to introduce another champion of small business, a key member of the United States Senate Small Business Committee, and somebody who represents the state of Maryland with an ardent voice. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Cardin. Well, thank you very much, Administrator Contreras Sweet. We thank you for your incredible leadership on behalf of small business in, in our country. The President Obama chose well. And we thank you so much for everything that you are doing. Over that side now. OK, either side is good. But you're with another champion, uh, Senator Cantwell, in her leadership on the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee. Uh, we do have a person who understands that we can't be passive in helping small business, that small business is where innovation and job growth will take place in this country, uh, and that we need to pay attention. And it's good to be here with Senator Kane, who's one of the great leaders on, on our manufacturing issue. I, I've. Uh, been doing a Made in Maryland tour where I visit companies in my state. Uh, we make incredible products, and Maryland, Maryland companies can compete with any company in the world if we have a level playing field. American manufacturing can compete on a level playing field with any country in the world. But we cannot give up tools that are available when other countries don't. As the administrator said, this unilateral disarmament is, costs us jobs and cost our economy. And we've done that too many times in the past. And we need to make sure that this tool, the XM Bank, the Export-Import Bank, which provides a way in which we can compete on a level playing field, needs to be reauthorized. I want to make one other point on this. As I've gone around talking to businesses in Maryland, they tell me they need to know the rules of the game. And when we do these short-term reauthorizations, they can't plan. 
They're talking about putting, getting investors to invest in manufacturing in this country, to invest in their businesses. How can you do that if you don't know what the rules are? So I would urge Congress to take up this year a long-term reauthorization of the XM Bank. It is desperately needed for our economy, for jobs, and for America being able to participate in the global market, and that, that's critically important. So, okay, I could tell you about a lot of different companies. We have a lot of small businesses in Maryland that benefit from the XM Bank. But, uh, but I have Bobby Patton here who can tell you and put a face on the issue on one company, Patton Electronics, which is located in the state of Maryland. Uh, this is a company that uh, Bobby and his family started, that we have seen tremendous job growth, that participate in global economy and can tell you how important these tools are so that we do have a level playing field and that we can keep jobs here and expand jobs in the United States. Uh, Bobby Patton from El Patton Electronics in the state of Maryland. Thank you. Well, I'm going to just tell a little bit of background about my company. I'm, I'm one of 10 kids. Um, my parents uh, raised all of us in uh, Rockville, Maryland. Uh, Bill, Bonnie, Bruce, Ben, Barry, Bobby, Bert, Beverly, <laughs> Buffy, Barbie, Barbara, and Bob. And, uh, and when, when all those t 10 kids were going through college, it was quite an expensive endeavor. When I was uh, about a sophomore in college at Montgomery College, um, my father had a heart attack and a stroke and looked like he was going to pass away. And uh, so while he was in his hospital room, I was sitting with him and talking to him about, hey, how do I start a business? He was a serial entrepreneur. He had started businesses um, over and over and over again. And so he, he started showing me the ropes and teaching me what to do. And I started following his instructions. And we started this little company selling communications equipment that we were, at the time, mostly importing, repackaging, and selling here in the United States. But we were hot in the high-tech business. And our customers started to ask us to make it smaller, faster, cheaper. And our suppliers couldn't make it smaller, faster, cheaper. But I was studying engineering, and so I worked with a group of engineers that I knew to make it smaller, faster, and cheaper on our own. And we started selling them. And we started growing. And I needed more capital. I asked my dad, hey, um, that $5,000 that you gave me uh, isn't going to be enough for the inventory that I need. I need a little bit more cash in order to uh, capitalize this inventory. Eventually, uh, we capped out of my dad's cash and uh, couldn't, couldn't go anymore, and so we had to start looking for working capital in other places, and the business is growing. And being on the internet, we were very early in the international business. We were very early getting demand from places all over the world that we'd never heard of, saying, hey, can you sell us your product? And the transactions were small, and the risk was low, so we sold our products. Sometimes we asked for a credit card, sometimes we asked them to pay in advance. But as the deals got bigger and they got more competitive, we needed to offer terms that they would pay after the equipment was installed. And so we had to capitalize that inventory and that transaction for a period of 30, 60, 90 days, sometimes longer. And we did it on our own, on our own risk, without much difficulty. But then, that got to be a growing piece of our business. And our bank started coming to us and say, hey, you're starting to have a significant portion of your business that's outside the US. How are you going to collect that if it goes bad? We don't know if we want to underwrite that. We can't give you a line of credit based on those receivables. So I'm like, what's the solution? Looking around. No real good solutions. I went to private credit insurance. It was just too darn expensive. Our transactions were small compared to the kinds of things that the credit insurance companies like to do. And the, then the, uh, the kinds of conditions and terms that they put on it were onerous for us to be able to comply with them. Well, we ran across a bank that introduced us to the Exim Bank Working Capital Line of Credit, and they came in and we signed up on that arrangement and grew and grew and grew, and now 70% of our business is coming from outside the United States. We have about 100 employees in Gaithersburg, about 50 others around the world acting as technical support and salespeople in the local economies where we're selling the products so we can reach out and touch them. This is a really critical piece of our business. 
we would not be able to sustain the kind of business that we're doing now without a product like the XM has. And trust me, I keep looking at private options. I'm a Republican. I keep looking at private options. And you know what? They're not there. The XM is the only option that I have. And so I'm fully behind this thing. It's something that is essential for the growth and continuity of my business. And like, like was said, if we only plan for a couple of months from now to you know, renew it for a few months at a time, that's not going to work for me. My customers want 90 days payment terms. I can't make a deal now that isn't going to be insured in 90 days. It won't work. We need to have a longer term strategy. We've got to get behind XM. So I think. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from Senator Kane, who, as I said, is a co-chair of a manufacturing caucus and has been speaking about manufacturing issues. And uh, I just thank him for his leadership. Uh, so much of this issue is about the supply chain, which uh, may seem invisible, but when you're involved in manufacturing, you see it every day. Great. Thank you, Chairman Cantwell. And thanks to all who are coming. And I'm never going to agree to follow Bobby Patton again, because <laughs> um, his story just uh, really exemplified the proposition, Bobby, that it's a great story. And, and the real issue is, do you want a business like his to have a potential market of 300 million people, or do you want them to have a potential market of billions of people? Well, why wouldn't you want them to have a potential market of billions of people? But you don't get that. You don't, you don't allow the small businesses like Bobby's to have access to that global market without the XM Bank. And that's the, 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 what it has done for businesses for many, many years. But because the economy is more global now, you heard the administrator talk about how quickly their, their, their own business is going. And so we salute you for the work and for making it so plain. I grew up in a manufacturing household. My dad had a, a, a ironworking and welding shop. In a bad year, five employees. In a good year, seven employees. It was pre-internet. So he couldn't find customers all over the world. Right as he was getting ready to sell the business, the, the business model was changing. And he was like, wow, this, this would have been amazing. But the customers all over the world create their own sets of questions. And often, local lenders are not able to feel comfortable. And that's where XM comes in. Um, I'm also an economic development guy. As a mayor and governor, I've done a lot of deals. I've done a lot of deals. And I work with a lot of businesses. And the manufacturing businesses in Virginia are so excited to have the ability to reach global customers that they never could. In Virginia, we have a port, just like Maryland does. We have an international airport, just like BWI has international flights. So we can reach out, and we can touch businesses all around the world. But it doesn't help if you can't get access to credit to enable you to expand your businesses. Um, I took the floor last week. A chairwoman Cantwell was giving a speech about XM, and I got up and spoke right after her. And I, it, I was like a rock, paper, scissors speech. I said, I want to talk about four businesses in Virginia, rockets, apples, compressors, and paper. Those were the four businesses I talked about. So we're dealing with all kinds of businesses. But let me just tell you about one. Bristol Compressors is a manufacturing business in far southwest Virginia. As, as long a drive as you can get in Virginia, that's where this is, on the, on the uh, Virginia-Tennessee border. They manufacture compressors for residential and and, uh, and light commercial uses, air conditioning, heat pump, refrigeration. They're on every continent except Antarctica. They don't need air conditioning there, right? So they're, they're not in Antarctica. But they have customers all over the, uh, over the world. How many uh, countries do you serve about? We're, uh, in the last five years, we've sold to 140 different countries. Wow. Bri Bristol Compressors is like this guy, countries all over the world in six con continents. They've worked indirectly with Export-Import Bank for many, many years, decades. Bristol wouldn't be able to service the majority of its international business were it not for the support of XM Bank. And they made it absolutely plain to me, no XM Bank means our business shrinks, means we lay people off in Southwest Virginia, which is an economy that, that needs more jobs, not fewer jobs. That's what's at stake. Our manufacturing economy today, thank God manufacturing is growing again in the United States. It's growing because labor cost differentials are shrinking. It's growing because transportation costs are getting to be expensive. So rather than manufacture you know, everything in Poland and then ship it here, better for IKEA to build a plant in Danville, Virginia, which they have. Uh, the uh, fluctuating exchange rates often makes it helpful to bring manufacturing back. And we got a great manufacturing workforce. But you can have all of those things. But if you can't reach the customers that want to buy your products, and American products are still so desirable, then you're not going to be successful. And that's where the XM Bank came, comes in. This thing is better than apple pie, folks. I mean, it should not be a controversy. I stood up on the floor when we were together last week, and, and uh, Maisie Hirono was in the chair. And I said, Madam President, have I got a deal for you? Let's grow American jobs. 
Let's help American businesses find customers overseas, and let's do it at no cost to the taxpayer, actually, with money coming back to the taxpayer. Why would this be controversial? It's about the success of these businesses, and thousands and thousands like them. We need to do this, we need to do it now, and we need to reauthorize for a sufficient period to allow our businesses to plan and succeed. Thank you, Madam Chair.